Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am Commodore Sadid Malik, Chief Executive Officer and Secretary General of Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. The learned panelists, ladies and gentlemen, today's program will be moderated by Mr. Salim Zamindar, who is a graduate in economics from Boston University in USA and a Master of Business Administration from Durham University. He is a certified company director from Institute of Directors in UK and member governor of Board of Governors KCFR. May I now request Mr. Salim Zemidar to welcome the panelists and moderate the panel. Mr. Salim Zemidar. Thank you, Commodore Sadid Malik. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to moderate today's webinar on behalf of the Chairman and the Board of Governors of Karachi Council of Foreign Relations. I would like to convey a wholehearted welcome to the panelists and will soon be requesting Dr. Huma Bakai to introduce today's topic. Huma Bakai doesn't require introduction, but she is an associate professor at IBA Karachi, member committee on foreign affairs appointed by the prime minister. And she's also the vice chairman of Karachi Council of Foreign Relations. Dr. Huma Bakai, may I request you to introduce today's topic, please. Assalamu Good afternoon, and I welcome you all. Salim Zamidar Sahib just did that. Uh, the topic that we want to deliberate upon today is that is India on a slippery slope. There is a lot of discussion about what has happened to India as a state under the Modi government. And perhaps what we would like to do is demystify it. And uh, my responsibility is perhaps to set the tone for the same. So I came across a research that recently happened, which I thought was interesting, and I will share it with all of you. And that is that the foundation of contemporary Hindu nationalism was laid by an atheist. He wasn't a hardcore Hindutva person, so to say. Of course, it reached new heights under Narendra Modi's BJP. And country's 200 million Muslim minority is facing the worst kind of discrimination and persecution witnessed anywhere in the world, perhaps. It is you used to call Gaza the largest open prison in the world. Now, more and more people are saying that Kashmir is the largest open prison on the face of Earth, which where there are all kinds of uh, blackouts, which are uh, a violation of not just human rights, but also humanitarian rights. So there is not just, there's not one war crime that you can think of, and it is not being committed in the occupied valley. The Agde Savarkar, Savarka in fact, was the first person who invented the term Hindutva, which loosely translates into Hinduness. He was an uh, anti colonial revolutionary and he coined this term way back in 1923. The view emphasized that a nation of India, even if not Hindu, could fully embrace the geography, languages, and religions of Mother India. But gradually, as it progressed from religions, it became one religion, and that is Hindutva. I am sure there are saner elements in India who see what is happening and should come out and speak about it and hold this, pull it back stop it from happening because we realize that the international community for various reasons is not proactive about it there are concerns raised there is an academic debate about it but all that has happened is what i call lip service without any teeth in fact it has only emboldened india and encouraged india to do more of the same I'm going to revert to Urdu because this is my favorite sentence. And I think that what I want to say here is that India ko bedi India dalega. Because Arundhati Rai puts it even more beautifully. She says, and this is also something I say often, 
it is not the kashmiris that need freedom from india it is india that needs freedom from the kashmiris and ladies and gentlemen i have a very august panel to listen to and i'm very grateful to all those who have joined us the whole idea is that we deliberate upon what is happening in india and how dangerous it is for the region for the world but more importantly for india itself thank you thank you dr huma bakai that's a fantastic uh, may i now request brigadier tariq khalil retired for his elaboration over the topic he was awarded sitara at jurat in 1965 pride of performance and sitara imtiaz as well and he's also held positions in many trusts brigadier tariq khalil the floor is all yours please bismillahir rahmanir rahim thank you mr salim i have been writing on this subject from the last many years there are number of published articles my articles i always maintain that bharat or you can call it india is an artificial entity in the history if you go back they never have been whole subcontinent under one group their claims that chandragupta maurya ruled subcontinent are not proven by the history the only two times the subcontinent came under some sort of sebi rule one is aurangzeb and the other is the british even in british there were more than 576 autonomous states within the british empire there are certain fundamentals required for the integrity of the country in 1947 those fundamentals were in place they were based on two things one <clears throat> was secularism the other was the tolerance of others with the passage of time india lost these two fundamentals i have been talking on television of the rss is the in fact engine of hinduism and they have now penetrated deep into the indian polity in every sphere their affiliates in business in engineering in education in judiciary in executive in foreign affairs in politics they have gone to the grassroots now that has created an element of total intolerance within the indian society and the result all of you know so these fundamentals have shaken the bondage which was created by the founding fathers of bharat or india with the result the fault lines have now emerged both ethnically religiously economically and more so politically there was a school of thought within the indian scholars who thought we can bear the cost of status quo keeping intact in india but now with the chinese conflict emerging with indian going into quad with rising polarization within the indian i think the cost is not going to be bearable and india to my mind the beginning of the end has started but please remember elephants don't die in a day they take time and similarly we must not under underestimate our adversary we must continue to be vigilant for any onslaught which may be imposed on us because when such countries are in trouble the only way out to get away from the feeling of the masses is create war like situations thank you
May I now request uh, Ambassador Abdul Basit Saab, the former High Commissioner of Pakistan to New Delhi, India. He's also been Pakistan's ambassador to Germany and served at the Pakistan missions at Moscow, New York, Sanaa, Geneva, and London. The floor is all yours, Ambassador Abdul Basit Saab. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zamindar, and uh, uh, greetings to all uh, the panelists, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, to this seminar uh, by Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, India on a slippery slope. Uh, uh, I recall a very well-known uh, Indian politician, uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, once said that uh, whatever you say about India, the opposite is also true. So uh, I'm not really sure uh, that uh, uh, the, his observation uh, tessellates with the ground realities, but uh, it is absolutely correct that uh, India uh, is on a slippery slope. Uh, if you look around India and uh, what is happening there these days, especially during the last uh, seven years since uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, has taken over, uh, you see more and more uh, chasms between the state itself and, 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 the, and the society. And uh, we also see growing uh, tensions, uh, inter-societal tensions. Uh, and uh, resultantly, uh, India seems to be in chaos uh, and the fault lines which have always existed in India now appear to be more pronounced, uh, more visible uh, and uh, that should be a matter of concern to the people of India at large. Uh, the problem in my view is that, uh, uh, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, uh, now, the, the Hindutva, which was always present since 1923, uh, now the, those forces who are the votaries of Hindutva, resorting more and more to Hindutva's uh, ideological moorings, uh, its divisive and uh, violent moorings, as a matter of fact. And uh, hence, uh, India has been put uh, on a slippery slope. Uh, Dr. Bakai mentioned about that India is the largest democracy in the world. Uh, I think uh, over the years, India has been turned into uh, a kind of move from democracy to a majoritarian rule. And this has been done very skillfully by the BJP uh, RSS duo, uh, because uh, by mastering the uh, uh, the way the elections are held, uh, BJP has totally marginalized uh, minorities, uh, and in fact, in practice, have uh, disenfranchised them uh, to a larger extent. If you, I mean, there are over 200, 180 million Muslims. The leads, uh, and you uh, do not hear their voices. Uh, whosoever uh, raises uh, his or her voice, uh, he and she is called to go to Pakistan. So, uh, the Indian society, because of this uh, vast election machinery of the RSS BJP, uh, has become uh, uh, totally kind of fixated. Uh, to their Hindutva and they want to turn uh, India into a uh, Hindu Rashtra as the original objective uh, had been. So we need, uh, the people of India need to get rid of the Hindutva ideology and sooner the better. Thank you very much. Uh, we now request Ambassador Abdullah Hussain Haroon. He's a Pakistani politician, a businessman who has served as Foreign Minister of Pakistan in the caretaker government. He has previously served as a Speaker of Sindh Assembly and Pakistan Ambassador to the, to the United Nations. He's been a board member of various educational institutes, sports associations and charity organizations. Ambassador Abdullah Hussain Harun Saab, you have the floor, sir. A very good afternoon to all of you and especially you, Salim. Nice seeing you here. Pleasure, sir. 
a little confused, which I'm not normally. I found Bassett, as usual, erudite and very fact revealing, as I did the Brigadier, Mabakai. My confusion arises from the point that are we on the topic, which is India on a slippery slope? I think factually we might have exercised all our demons and uh, exposed all that India is moving towards in a very fast gear. Reminds me of Mr. Bhutto in 1970 when Pierre Trudeau was visiting Pakistan after the elections. And a great old man of foreign policy of Pakistan said there that the day that, do you know, Mr. Trudeau, that vociferous forces, and this is 1970, are in play in India. And Trudeau said, well, I haven't seen it anywhere. He said, no, no, we who know the subcontinent know better. And these vociferous forces will take India apart, not in a very long time from now. That was 50 years plus. Why I bring this up is that we have said this in various ways. And uh, we have yet to see the slippery slope Surely there are differences, disagreements, there is weaponry being used and conflict. And this not only is in India itself, but reflects in the country's neighbor to India. But what I want to bring out here, and how is whom observing the slippery slope? They have rewarded India by the Vice Presidency of the United States of America. They have rewarded India by the Chancellorship of Great Britain or the UK. When you look at the various examples of the rewards, it reminds me of how quickly we were dropped and they were ushered into the nuclear world perspective. We're also observing how they are forgiven anything practically. And we are punished for everything practically. Uh, so much so that if they do not see the ethical mistake in making India chairman, of the cat with nine tails that they use in Pakistan's back, Fatif. I think that absolutely makes sure. We are in the business of war. We're coming into an era when war will be all important. Alliances will be all important. Democracy doesn't stand a fifth of a chance. I mean, it's what's happened in Kashmir, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in so many places. Do they look democratic? No. And sadly, the Muslim world has borne the brunt of it, as is Sudan at the very moment. I've taken up my eight minutes or ten minutes. Thank you for listening to me. It was too short a time to elucidate any further. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Ambassador Abdullah Hussain Harun Saab, for your deliberation on this topic. Uh, Ambassador Sadar Masood Khan will not be able to join us because of his urgent preoccupation. So we will now shift to the question and answer session. We have a few questions uh, from members for the panelists. Uh, the first question is, uh, Kashmir issue has dragged on for more than 70 years despite UN resolutions. 
what can be done to force India to comply with UN resolutions and bring an end to Indian occupation. You see, uh, the two countries that are most sanctioned by the United Nations is India and uh, uh, Israel. The two biggest violators of UN sanction, uh, UN resolutions is also India and Israel. So uh, I don't think that it is the international community that is going to come to the rescue of the Kashmiris. I think it is India that should come to their rescue. And that is the point I've been emphasizing and re-emphasizing. Uh, Harun Hussain Saab is, you know, he's, he's right on spot when he says that, I mean, if you look at how things are, India is actually rewarded for bad behavior. But what is happening in India is toxic for India. What they're doing to the Muslims and Kashmiris is not just confined to Kashmiris. There was a, almost a movement for Khalistan, which was orchestrated in the UK. And it's all over India. It's even their own people. It's the Dalits. So if you ask me what's going to happen to the Kashmir issue or will the international community intervene to resolve it? No. But I think it's the compulsion from within India that should propel the sane in India to find a solution which is acceptable to all. And yes, the peace of this region is hostage to the Kashmir issue. And it must get resolved, not because it's a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan, but because it is a human right issue. It is about humanity itself. And because if the world has a conscience, which it seems it doesn't, it should respond to the situation. So my take on it is that I don't have an answer to that, but I wish to God I see it happening in my lifetime. We will now take another question uh, from the members. We have one which is, uh, history is replete with freedom struggles in every continent and in every century, and now it is on Kashmir. There's none of the usurpers who let go the struggles without an armed struggle and support from like-minded nations, as was indicated in one of the seminars by former President of Azad Kashmir, that unless there is an armed intervention and general uprising of local people, there is no possibility of Kashmiris to get freedom. Therefore, it is proposed that an intervention into Kashmir by general public be allowed to help the local indigenous efforts or we should forget about Kashmir. Very important question. I remember very clearly uh, my comrades who went in. But with the passage of time, after the revocation of Article 370 and 35A, withdrawal, and declaring India, Kashmir, a union territory, There has been a sea change in the struggle by the Kashmiris. I may be wrong, but as a soldier and as a student and as a participant also to some extent, both the wars, the father in Kashmir has now, to my mind, turned into armed struggle. Logistics is most important for such struggle to sustain and continue. And I am very sure that logistic lines will develop. How? I don't know. But they will develop. They are still, they are going in and may not be from Pakistan, maybe from elsewhere, maybe from within India. But the lines will be and uh, this struggle is going to intensify and uh, Pakistan is the most important uh, concerned party must keep a watch and how our behavior is going to be. Thank you. I totally agree and everybody has a right to an opinion. but. My thrust here is that it is extremely attractive to talk about an armed intervention. It's almost seductive, but impossible to sustain. And I also think that it is going to harm the Hurriyat more than help, because it will allow India to revert 
to the whole concept of cross border terrorism and so on and so forth the fact that huriyat has stayed alive and it's indigenous is the biggest challenge to indian occupation and pakistan should i can't agree more with the bilwasit saab that we should be working on the diplomatic front and the intellectual front those are the fronts that will give the sustainability to the struggle and the support armed intervention is just seductive not sustainable thank you dr huma i would like to thank all our panelists uh, dr huma bakai brigadier saab and ambassador basit and uh, ambassador haroon for their deliberation and their insights into a very very topical uh, question of today's times uh, with that i would like to now hand over to the chief executive officer of karachi council of foreign relations commodore sadid malik saab for the closing announcements over to you uh, sadid saab thank you very much mr salim zamedar our learned panel members with vision and exposure have very well analyzed today's topic i feel this needs to be seen as what could be a patriotic indian feeling and how would they react upon the action taken by the body government <coughs> which will ultimately decide as far as today's topic is concerned though the congress government had had a similar stance toward the muslims in india on loc with pakistan and lsc with china but ever since arrival of this government especially after winning the majority in their rajya sabha the upper house of parliament this government has started passing laws that were never ostensibly imagined by the earlier governments including congress do pota prevention of terrorism act law was passed by the earlier government but it has been implemented ruthlessly and especially in kashmir examples of recent applications especially in there has shaken up faith in a secular india to the extent that people like former indian government appointed by them like chief minister of kashmir farooq abdullah and mehbooba mufti interalia other leaders in other states including from bengal and elsewhere also have spoken against the modi government continuous increase in the defense budget of india has reduced the progress of india that was called when it was called india shiny amendments of indian constitution for removing the special status in kashmir as highlighted by the were the panelists has shaken up the faith of majority of the right minded persons in india and sir this has rightly been pointed out by the panelists that if the present fascist autocratic democracy in india continues slipping then the affected minorities especially sikhs and muslims could raise the level of protest where some sort of an internal bloodshed could take and that could lead to the affected communities that would cause to demand a referendums that has already taken place in uk by the sikhs thank you very much 